Hello, 你好 Welcome to Mandarin Mama Chit Chat. It is where Trista and Yao Yao, two Taiwanese moms, share intriguing conversations with amazing people from all over the world. We're super excited and grateful to have you here, and really hope you enjoy our chit chat. Hi, everyone! Welcome back to Mandarin Mama Chit Chat. Hey, before we get in, I want to make sure you guys all click on that subscribe button, so you will get notification on our new episode every Tuesday. And if you like our episode, make sure you share to a friend and, and bring them into our community. We can grow and learn and support each other. And don't forget to leave a review for us, cause it will mean so much for us and keep us going and bring on more amazing guests. Today we are in a treat. We are interviewing Eugenia. I love our conversation. Eugenia is so fun, intelligent. Real, and I'm really grateful she opened up and being very vulnerable with us. I believe every one of you can resonate and relate with her story and her journey. Eugenia is American-born Chinese. She grew up not liking to speak Mandarin because she wants to fit in. She wants to be quote unquote American, right? And I think growing up in America, perhaps many of us felt that way. Perhaps speaking Mandarin is a little embarrassing when you are a teenager, especially we don't have blue eyes and blonde hair. We want to be like them, especially back in the days. Now it's definitely the world is changing. It's different now, but back in the days when there aren't. That many Asian representation living in America, especially when you're a teenager, you just want to fit in. You want to be cool. You want to be part of the team. So I can totally resonate. Even though I didn't really grow up here, I wasn't born here. And like she mentioned, it's really cringy to think about it now because now we're all adult and moms. We don't want that for our child. Another thing about Eugenia that I'm just so Inspired by her, that she sacrificed so much for her son Brendan. Eugenia, she's a lawyer. She studied hard and practiced for fifteen years. She gave it all up to become a stay-at-home mom because she feels like she's missing out a lot on her son's journey. Which it's not easy. I have to say, it's not easy to give up your career. And some people can do it. Some people aren't able to. Some people want to be a stay-at-home mom, but financially, they just it it just doesn't work. But some people they probably can be a stay-at-home mom, but they don't want to because it's, I mean, it's a lot of work staying at home with kids, right? And everyone is different. Every there's no wrong, right or wrong choice. It's whatever you decide, whatever you choose. I just felt so inspired by Eugenia's story because. I think it takes a lot of courage to make that decision, because being a lawyer in the world view, it's a prestigious job, high-paying job, and for her to give up her career, I I feel like it's a big sacrifice, and I'm. I'm grateful for her to come on to share her story, and I think it's amazing. Now, after being a stay-at-home mom, she found another passion. She is an author, publishing five books already, which is super amazing. And she's promoting culture and language in her books, and I love what she's doing. Okay, let's welcome Eugenia. Hi, Eugenia. Thank you for coming. Hi! Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited to chat with you. Can you start introducing yourself? Because looking at your IG, I know you used to be a lawyer、mm-hmm. and turning to a stay-at-home mom, and now you're an author. What a journey! Can you share with us? Take us back. You always want to be a lawyer, or is more I don't know pressure from the parents and like all that transition and your cultural background too. Well, I I always wanted to be a lawyer、uh-huh. ever since I was a little girl. I don't know why. Maybe my parents somehow, you know, kind of hinted. <laughs> but I always wanted to be a lawyer.、Um, and then when I had my son, 
I, I still never planned on stopping to work or anything like that. But mm-hmm. then after I had my son, um, it was it was just tough because I felt like I was missing so much. And I had I even had a nanny for a little while so that I could keep working part time because I figured I'd, I'll start doing part time and then that way I could spend some more time with him. But I was still I was missing too much, and I found myself doing both poorly. Uh-huh. So the parents who actually worked, I'm like I'm so in awe of them because I just I couldn't do it. So what, something mm-hmm. had to give. So I, I eventually, I, I slowly weaned myself off and I stopped working, became a, a full-time stay-at-home mom. And then um, I've, I've always surrounded my, my, myself with books. I love books. When I, was, when I was pregnant, I started buying baby books. And my son was born, I started buying children's books. And I was always looking for a particular type of book because I was trying to teach my son Chinese. Uh, so everything I would say to him, I'd, I'd say twice. I'd say it in English. And then I try my best to say it in Chinese. I am not fluent. <laughs> but I knew, you know, the baby words and, you know, things like tree, su, you know, food, you know, that things like that I could say in Chinese. So I would try to repeat everything. So I wanted to find books for him that also would, I, I don't know, just support what I was trying to teach him, have some vocabulary. And I also wanted him to have books where there were Chinese characters, Asian characters, so that he could see himself in books. Yeah. And so for the longest time, I couldn't find any of these type of books. So I just started writing them. Um, we would talk about his day and I would just start writing little stories about things that he loved to do. And then we would read them together at night. And that's when I started writing. This was years ago. Never thought about publishing. Shared a story. Uh, one of the, my book, first book, I shared this story with my sisters uh, who have kids around uh, Brandon's age. And they read it to them and the kids loved it. And they always wanted them every night. They say, oh, read the, the Brandon Makes Child Zip book. Bring, make, read that book again and again and again. And they're like, you know what? This is, this is great. Maybe you should consider publishing. Because we were all looking for books that were written in English that had just a little bit of Chinese culture and language in it. Didn't mm-hmm. want a full bilingual book because it was just, that would be really hard for us to read as well. And then if we're trying to teach them a little bit at a time, we didn't want it f- to feel like such a struggle. We wanted something fun, like a storybook mm-hmm. that you could read at nighttime, but which included a little bit of Chinese uh, language and culture. Years went by, still couldn't find this type of book. And then, you know, I'm like, okay, let's just go for it, try it. And so first book, Brandon makes Jiaozi based uh-huh. on... Many- it's because Jazza are Chinese dumplings, you guys know, but for everybody else, um, every time my mom and my father, they come to visit, Brandon's favorite thing, and it became a tradition, my mom, Popo, grandma, and Brandon, they would make Chinese dumplings, Jazza together every single time. And that was his favorite thing. Whenever she was here, he would talk nonstop about it. Before bed, he was like, oh, I made Jazza and Popo, and this is what we did, and how mess we made, and all this. It was so yummy and so funny. And so that was, that was the first book. And from there, you know, I got such a great feedback and not only from Chinese parents, but I I just, I was surprised that I got feedback from people of all different cultures. And so that really encouraged me to keep writing. And then I made a great connection on, on Instagram and Facebook. I made a, I met a lot of other authors who are just like me, wanted to teach their kids Chinese. And so they started writing as well. And it's just, we've all bonded and we've helped each other. And also even uh, other children's books authors who don't write bilingual books or anything through Chinese, but we all support each other. And so I've been able to just continue my journey, which has been amazing. So that's how I started writing books. <laughs> wow. That is amazing. So how many books do you have now? Well, I have five books. Oh, let me show you. So Random Mix Jazz is the first one, picture book. And then I wrote two chapter books because as Brandon was getting older, the yeah. character in my book was getting a little bit older. And we had we we travel a lot. So we've gone to Beijing. Brandon goes to Beijing. And we went to Hong Kong a couple of years ago. Brandon goes to Hong Kong. I wow. love it. It's I nice. love it. Um, and then um I started doing holiday books. So my my most of my books are self-published, but then my one first book, holiday book, celebrating Chinese New Year traditionally published and it was so well received and I learned so much about Chinese New Year as well so I wanted to pass that on to Brandon and all the kids in the neighborhood so I wrote another one with my friend YY Chan who's based out in China and Hong Kong celebrating Mid-Autumn Festival Mm -hmm. and then I got together with a group of author friends and we put together a cookbook Once Upon a Plate and it's based on 
the stories that we've written. So each recipe is based on stories. So in this book, I have a jiaozi recipe, I have a bok choy recipe, I have a mooncake recipe. So it's it's、uh, written for kids, very easy recipes based on our stories. So it tells a little bit about the story. I love the name too. Once、oh. upon a plate. Yeah, How was, cute is that? Yeah, yeah. as with a group of author friends, we call ourselves Author Force. We actually have a chat on、um, Instagram where I'm meeting a lot of my author friends. And、uh, yeah, it was just such a fun collaboration. Wow! Are they all women, all moms. Yes, <laughs> I love it. Women supporting women. Yes, you, yes. You women、both. supporting women. Authors supporting authors. So it's it's been a it's a great journey. And so I have so a few more books coming、Brandon? out. So it's very exciting. Brand is fourteen、yeah. now, and before、okay. uh, this started, we were just saying you teach、uh, Chinese in high school. So Brandon's、mm-hmm. been taking Chinese、uh, ever since he was. Two years old, and he's taking Chinese in high school too. And I'm thinking, oh my god, that's got to be like the hardest job teaching a high school kid Chinese, because he's like, it's pretty fun. Oh, that's good to hear because he because you know I hear a lot of complaining <laughs> about how hard it is and how there's so much homework. And I'm like, well, you know, you need to practice every day. So yeah, I think people have different approaches. For me, it's more like I meet students where they are. And for me, it's like if they don't want to do it, I don't want to make a chore, just like maybe painful for them. So maybe to some, I am too lax. No, <laughs> but I think I'm just like at, like me, the students at the middle, like push them a little bit, but not like too strict. No, that's I lower that's, my bar. Yeah, that way they don't quit. Exactly. Yeah, gotta keep them. Yeah, I love that so much because your book development, the storyline is like follow your son's. Life like growth, yeah. yeah so fun because I do scrapbooking, but it just like to myself. Obviously, I'm not publishing scrapbooks, but it's almost like kind of similar idea too. Like you know, you guys went on these trips, and you guys just you roll them into books, and other kids get to see the world, travel with you through your books. That is、yeah. that is incredible. Thank you. That's exactly what I'm going for. <laughs> How long did you start publishing book、um, after you became a stay at home mom? Oh gosh! Years later,、um, my after my son was born, let's see, he was already in elementary school when I f- published the first book. I think he was.、Um, I started writing stories when he was like two or three, and then when I published the first book, he must have been around、um, nine, us、uh, maybe around seven or eight.、Mm-hmm. So it's many years before I published the first book, and then it was another two years before I published the next book because I back then. I wasn't on social media. I didn't know what I was doing, and I, I, I had just, I, I was just clueless, and I just kind of let it sit there for a while. And also, I was still a little bit overwhelmed being a mom because my kid was still little; he was still in elementary <laughs> school.、Um, so it took me two years before I published the next one. But then, since then, now he's much older; he's in high school. So it's,、yeah. I'm doing more. I'm doing more on social media. I'm doing more writing. I'm doing more publishing.、Um, I'm meeting. More authors. I'm、um, doing more book fairs and events, and library visits and things like that. So it's it's getting easier as he's getting older. But when he was little, I just felt overwhelmed. Now I know a lot of mom authors who have really little kids. I'm like, I don't know how you do it. I was just like trying to keep my kid alive back then, <laughs> and they're doing so much. I'm like, wow, you guys are amazing. So there's a lot of inspiration out there. Well, something I found so interesting in your journey is, as a world view looking at your life, like you were a lawyer, and and in the world view, lawyer is like, oh, you're a lawyer, like a prestigious job, right? And how you just like, I'm done with that. Like I'm giving it up. I'm gonna stay home with my kids. That's how does that transition? Like goes as people or your parents or like kind of like wh- why would you do that? Like you are a lawyer, you just give everything up and stay at home. Of course, right now looking at what you're doing, it's amazing. You found your passion and you're, you know, writing books and helping all these children. It's just such an amazing inspiration, like inspirational.、Um, so just kind of just so curious about that、uh, process. How that how does that go? Yeah,、you? you know, it was it was a little tough because. I did go to school for so long, and I practiced fifteen、yeah. years, and I'm like, oh my gosh, and there was a lot of doubt because I felt I felt bad, I felt bad stopping work, and there was、um, some pre- there was prestige and there was respect, and then I stopped and I got no respect. 
Like, he's not going to respect me. Other people are like, oh, what do you do all day? I hate that question. I'm like, what do you do? Yeah, do you I, do? I was a stay home. I am a stay home mom for like 10 years. So I know, and I definitely not a lawyer before. So I had a lot of that doubts and identity. Like, I'm just a stay at home mom. I, I really, you know, that that's a really hard. Yeah. To There's no such thing as just, just a stay at home. <laughs> yeah. The hardest job being a stay at home mom. And you're busy all day. And then you try to explain to people what you're doing. And you don't remember every single thing you did. And it just, it drives me nuts when people are like that. Because it's it's such a tough job. And it's such an important job. I just, uh, but yeah. But it, it was tough because um, I went from interacting uh, with adults to just like two syllable words, one syllable word. It's like, oh, poo-poo, go poo-poo. <laughs> shoo Safanla, eat, eat, you know. <laughs> so for a while there, I, I wasn't speaking with any adults. I wasn't like seeing anybody. So that was that was a little bit, a little bit tough transition. But it was the best decision of my life. Oh, almost isolating as well, right? Yeah. So like I, um, so I I work, but as a teacher, I as a teacher, I have the summer off. So like I feel like kind of like good in both worlds. I get to enjoy the stay home mom phase like experience during my summer but then I also teach you know during school year and I I mean to be honest if I could cut back on like if I could just be a stay-at-home mom I would like it a lot more I mean just you know kind of you're missing so much and you know send my kids away to daycare and stuff but at least I have the summer off too I just can't imagine like other just like regular regular jobs you know like nine to five and there's really no you don't have a they have like 14 days off for the whole year and the holidays like that for me is it it sounds painful. It just it just it hurts me to to think about you have to be separate from your kids for you know yeah. But I mean like that's unfortunately that's kind of the norm. But I totally mm-hmm. agree. Like during the summer, I mean I enjoy. By the same time, I'm like overwhelmed. I'm just like oh my god. Like I crave some adult time. Is I like, isolating or yes, I meet with other moms with similar age kids. But like we don't talk. We can't even talk. We're like constantly chasing after. So I have a four year old and a two year old. So I'm in oh, the thick <laughs> Yeah. I love it. They're like growing like weeds. And then they're like, yeah, it's it's fun. But also it's like, a, it's challenging. And it's, um, yeah, I totally agree with like, so what did you do all day? Uh, I don't know. I'm exhausted. I, I cannot yeah. do anything for myself. I came and eat. Like, what do you mean? Just eat with them. I'm like, uh, no, I can't. They're throwing food yeah. everywhere and then touching everybody, touching each other. I'm like, no, I cannot eat. And after right. I finished eating, so I had to clean up or I had to play with them. Like, they like what do you mean i'm like uh if you're a parent you would know <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah exactly being a stay home mom is stay home parent is really it's hard and you have yeah. no time to yourself because being at work you have lunch break and they're like you are you have your own autonomy while you're caring for little ones you you don't have that yeah. exactly no time and, yourself. yeah and, and you know there's some people they they really they need they need to work or they just want to work because it makes them a better mom as well. So mm-hmm. I guess the, the, the takeaway is just don't judge. Like it's really hard not to judge whether a mom works or stays at home or does part time. You know, we just can't judge because we don't know what their mom, the mom is going through. We don't know what the kids are going through. And I don't know. I just want people just be kind. You don't know what people are going through. You don't know what their situation is. So I mean, I know moms on the weekends and they were like full time working moms on the weekends. Oh my God, I can't wait Monday. I want to go back to work. (laughs) Yeah, because it's more exhausting. Yeah, it's so like we are, we're all different. And sometimes it's, it's a choice. Right. Like it's a choice. Like we can probably go back to work, but we choose to stay home. But some people can probably, they they want to stay at home, but they they, they can't, you know, they're not able to. So it's, it's, they're just doing the best they can, right? Mm -hmm. All the moms are doing the best they can. So, yes, exactly. I want to ask about Eugenia, about you, your story has, uh, because you want to teach your kid, Brandon, Mandarin, right? And then like also the culture and stuff too. So like, why? I mean, we all have our reasons, right? So could you like kind of walk us back to like your own upbringing, your experience growing up and what make you decide or commit it to wanting to teach the language and the culture to your son? Okay, well, my upbringing, um, I was born and raised in the U.S. We moved around a lot, but everywhere we lived, we were the only Chinese family. 
we were the only Asians for years and years and years. So, I mean, I always felt a, a little different. And I had, especially in elementary school, the most developmental years, uh, we lived in Massachusetts in a um, fully Caucasian neighborhood. My school was all Caucasian. We were the only Chinese Asian minority family. Um, I had a great experience because my parents were still involved. My mom, especially, she was involved in school and this way no one would bully us or think we were different. So she would share the culture with everybody she could. So that was, all right, so all you parents out there who are trying your best and you're doing these little things and you're not getting any appreciation, eventually you will. I didn't appreciate any of this. My son does not appreciate anything I do, but I'm hoping in the future he will. He will. So every little thing you do, it makes a huge difference. But my upbringing, again, I had no, my only uh, content or uh, my only contact with Chinese culture, language, people, my parents. That was it. Uh, for a couple of years, I went to Saturday Chinese school and we went to Chinese church, but they were just so far away. Uh, I did it for a little while. But then um, we had to stop when we moved because there was no Chinese school, no Chinese church um, after we moved when I was in fifth grade. So... My parents spoke Chinese at home. My mom is from Taiwan. My father's from Hong Kong. So they spoke Mandarin at home so I could understand. But a lot of the like the holidays, I only knew a little bit about. I only know about food. And uh, they tried to get us to speak Chinese at home. My mom was always like, you know, speak Chinese. So don't win. And we were like, my, it was me and my two sisters. My brother came many, many years later. But three of us, we'd all of a sudden, once we started school, we'd always want to speak English. And she'd say that we'd just become mute. And so she would just give up and then she would forget and then she would speak to us in English and we'd all speak English again. So it was really, really hard. So my parents did the best we could. Uh, they could. We could all understand Chinese at least. Mm. Speaking is not so great. Um, my speaking got better because I spent some time in Taiwan during my gap year between college mm. and law school. So I had the, the foundation and then I had the desire to learn more later. But when I was little... I did not. This is horrible to say. I did not want to learn Chinese. I did not want to speak Chinese. I wanted to, all the kids. All you know, the kids. I wanted to be American. I wanted to be like all of my yes. friends. Yes. And back then, there were no Chinese characters in books or TV or movies or anything. It was just everybody was Caucasian, white. So I wished I had blonde hair and blue eyes like everybody else I saw. I hate saying that. It makes me cringe to think that and to say that. But that's how it was when I was growing up. Uh, so now as a mom, I never really thought much about that until I became a mom. And then now I don't want my, my son to feel any of that. And the good thing is now everything is a lot more diverse. So even where we live, there aren't many Chinese people. I'm, I'm in Miami Beach. There aren't many Chinese people, but there's diversity. There's all kinds of people. And there are even a few Asians in my son's school. <laughs> so he doesn't feel that way. I think he's always been proud to be Chinese or part Chinese. Um, now, during Chinese part, he's not so thrilled about, but he has the foundation and we're keeping it up and he's still taking it in high school. And he did take Chinese Saturday school as well, even though I didn't like it. I still forced him to take it. <laughs> and it, I think it was good. Um, so hopefully as he gets older, like when I got older, I, I wanted to learn. He will as well. And it'll be a lot easier for him to learn just because he has a foundation and he can speak some and he can understand some. So I'm trying my best. <laughs> yeah, we are all trying our best. And then I think what you've done is um, it's not just trying your best. You've done great. Like you, <laughs> Thank you. wonderfully. And I can totally relate. So I moved um, to the U S I was an exchange student in high school and I was one of the few, I think there were another one. Asian, I think, uh, but uh, I never, I never talked to him. Uh, but he was raised and born here, so like, but me, like, just being insert, like, yeah. And I, the first thing I want to do is to fit in, and yeah. uh, but my parents weren't here. I was with um, my host family; they were white. Uh, but it just, I totally understand about like I was self conscious about my own accent, uh, and yeah. then I would. Like if I speak on the phone with my parents, like obviously back in Taiwan, right? In Mandarin, I feel self-conscious. I feel like I always like go to a, a, in a room or corner. Like I didn't want people to oh. hear me speaking Mandarin. So like, I totally really, like now like feel me, made me feel awful about it because why should I be ashamed or embarrassed of who I am? Or even my parents, like I shouldn't impose that onto them. I don't think I shared that with them. So that's good because that would be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, but um, but now um, like reflecting on it, like well, I shouldn't do that. Like, why did I do it? And again, kind of like what you like feel about your own son. Like, I don't want my children to feel embarrassed or self conscious. And so, mm-hmm. in the beginning, actually, I was self conscious about speaking Mandarin with them to them in public. But now I just I just do it. I'm like. Okay. <laughs> like sometimes people like, you know, look at us not necessarily in a hostile way, but might maybe just like, oh, curious. Oh, that's a different. So I live in Ohio. It's less diverse. <laughs> um, yeah. But I haven't experienced any like, un- like I have not had any uncomfortable experiences, which is good. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so now I'm just like slowly building on my confidence and comfortable. Com- yeah. F- feeling more comfortable like speaking Mandarin to them. But yes, my four year old son actually voiced, uh, voice his opinions at age three saying like he did not want to speak Mandarin <laughs> and I should just speak English and I just keep I just keep doing it and we'll see he does go to a Sunday Chinese school here is Sunday but um I don't know but yeah just every little thing helps yeah so I can totally relate your like what you just shared and thank you for sharing the vul- your vulnerability being vulnerable because it's, it's hard to to voice it to share you know, that it's, it's a little embarrassing right because you know you always want to be proud of who you are and yeah but I think that's a lot of us growing up here in the U.S. too you know back in the days really don't have much representation of Asians and and I think back in the days that now of course it's getting better but back in the days the beauty standard or like the dolls the Barbie they all have blonde hair blue eyes and really don't have or princess, right? Disney princess. Uh, I mean, we have a Mulan. That's about it. Um, really. So like to me, thinking back, like, okay, what's, you know, beauty standard. Okay, I have black hair. I don't have blonde hair or, or blue eyes. So I think we all have that. Insecurity. We were, insecurity. Yeah. yeah, growing up. Yeah, because I really, I really hurt your self-esteem when you don't feel, you know, pretty and you yeah. just you just feel like you you are different and you're kind of like alien so it's mm-hmm. it really I, I feel it hurts a, a child's health self-esteem and their image of themselves and you want them to have pride in their heritage and their culture so it's great I think things are a lot better now there's so many more resources and then in the media and books there's a lot more Chinese actors and characters so it's getting better I mean it could still get more better but it's it's getting it's a lot better now it's a lot better now even today there's so many more books that weren't around when my son was very little so I have a lot of author friends who write um board books and picture books I'm like oh my gosh why didn't you guys start like 10 years ago (laughs) so it would have been it would have been great having more resources to share Mm -hmm. so it's getting better right so, um, so you are learn like teaching the language and culture to your son, brain and like Chinese culture and Mandarin. What about your husband's part? Like, is he like not involved he, at all, or like he what's doesn't speak any Chinese? Oh. He doesn't speak any Chinese. So he's he's he supports me in our Chinese learning journey. Sometimes we'll try to learn a word or two, but then my son will make fun of his pronunciation. <laughs> so the the most my son speaks now, now that he's a teenager, and refuses to speak Chinese most of the time. He, the only time I'll speak is to make fun of my husband in front of him. I'm like, oh, great. But it's funny. <laughs> you know, we all laugh about it because he's not mean about it. But it's it's just, it's just kind of funny. So, um, yeah. So I don't, I don't really get uh, help at home because nobody else speaks. Right. So are your parents live around you guys or they live further away? No. Um, my parents uh, live far away. My mom is actually visiting now. She's She's out right now walking the dog. <laughs> But she she visits um, once in a while, and she she tries to speak Chinese to him, but she forgets, and she'll switch over to English, just like she did with us. And now it's even more of an English speaking household because my husband doesn't speak at all, and so she just ends up speaking English too. And I'm like, Mom, speak to him in Chinese. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, um, and she'll speak. I'm like, Brandon, did you understand her? And he'd be like, Yeah, I'm in practice. And then he'll like speak in English, and she'll forget again, and they all speak in English. So. But no. it's still better than nothing. <laughs> right, for sure. Yeah. I'm sure with your mom living in the States for so long, like yeah, English, she's, she's, she's comfortable with language. Yeah. Right. Sometimes so like my parents are still both back in Taiwan, but sometimes we'll like FaceTime. My mom, I mean, she speaks English, but minimum English, not like fluent by any means, but she does speak some English. Uh, and then sometimes like I would, I would be in the kitchen doing something and I would like hear my mom speaking English to my son. I'm like, no, mom, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> like we have, like we don't have any Mandarin yeah. speaking people around me already. Like I am essentially the only person speak Mandarin to him aside from the Sunday school. But the Sunday school, the teachers also like I was a majority also English, and yeah. uh, I'm like I need Amy like all the Mandarin input I can get. Yes, it's it is tough. Like where you live, mm-hmm. where I live, there's not many. I mean, I've been trying to find a Chinese nanny when out when he was first born. Mm-hmm. None. Oh, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Bro, that you shared that you took a gap year in Taiwan. And I'm yes. so interested in learning about that. I guess like what made you decide to do that? And how was how was that year? How was yeah. So it's funny. Um I I the first re- the reason why I went over to Taiwan in the first place is my parents had signed me up for this overseas study program for the summer. Maybe you guys have heard of it. It's a Gentan in Taipei and it's known as Love Boat. That's yeah, oh so my I, God. it's uh, real. It's real. Because oh, yeah, there, is, the there books. is a movie called Love in Taipei. Yep. So the person who wrote the book, uh, she she attended Love Boat Gentan. So it's a real thing. So oh I went. God. Oh my God. I just watched a movie and I love the movie. I thought I tried to fact check it, but I just thought it was fictional. Okay. Anyway, so I will let you continue your story. Oh, I'm well, just like, the book is fictional, but it's based on the real love boat right. and it's based on the books that she wrote. Just check out the books. Very, very good. Okay. Um, but so I, my parents signed me up for that. I'm like, I don't want to go to Taiwan. And so I ended up going, um, and this is really my first exposure to a lot of Chinese American kids and Chinese Canadians, Chinese European kids, because I, again, I never had Chinese people around. Even when I went to college, there were not many Chinese people around. Maybe only in the grad schools, the, the science grad. That, that's were. not your first time to Taiwan, is it? No, I went when I was very, very young, like okay. a toddler. So I don't remember anything. Oh. So this is the first time where I can remember. And I went, and there are all these cool Chinese Chinese kids. I'm like, oh my gosh, where have you guys been in my whole entire life? And so, you know, it's was, it was funny because they came from Big Range. Some of them didn't speak any Chinese at all. Some of them were fluent. Very few were fluent. And some of them were in between. Some were like me, can understand, but speaking not, not so good. And they're all, a lot of them, they're just so cool. And I would have totally been friends with them if I had known them. So <laughs> this turned me around. I'm like, oh, wow, okay. Uh, and then, um, you know, I, I had some time. I was like, okay, I can start grass. I can start law school right away. Or maybe I'll, I'll push this aside. And then at this point, I was like, you know what? I, sh- I should learn more. So I stayed on in, chi- uh, in Taiwan. I lived with my uncle who lived in Taipei. And I started taking Chinese lessons. And then I started teaching uh, English classes. And one of my friends who had also gone on Love Boat, she stayed on as well. So the both both of us, we taught together and, you know, we partied together this when we were young. So it was just such a wonderful experience. And I was able to get my Chinese back because really my speaking was horrendous before that. And I was always scared to speak because my accent was so heavy. So that gave me a lot of, um, I don't know, it, it gave me a lot of more confidence in speaking. And my writing, I had forgotten all my writing. So I'd gotten up to second grade level writing. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> so- <laughs> So I was all proud of myself, and I, you know, I got down the bopo mofo all down there, and so I was able to like read the newspaper. I didn't know what I was saying, but I could at least read it. Uh, and it's just, it was a great, great experience, and it brought me back to my roots. It brought me mm-hmm. back to my culture, and then I had a greater appreciation, and I had a greater appreciation for everything my parents had done and tried to do for me, as well. So, I, I think if I hadn't gone through that experience. I think I still would have tried to teach my son Chinese because, you know, it's it's who we are. It's our culture. It's our tradition. And we, it's it helps identify us. So I think it's really important to have some of that background and some of that knowledge and to instill it when they're young so that they have the foundation. And if they want to learn more later, they can. Like, I, I don't want to push too hard because my kid anyways – if you push too hard, they're going to go the other way. Yeah. So I don't know if all kids are like that, but my kid's like that. So, you know, I just try to nudge a little bit. But if he just starts saying, I hate this, I don't want to do it, I'll back off. I'll back off a yeah. little. I'm yeah. not sure if that's the right approach, but that's that's how I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's how I approach it too, because you don't want to associate this wonderful thing, right? The language yeah. and the culture to something negative. Right. Or something like a chore that just want to run away from. Exactly. Um, it's a tough one. Yeah, so your mom really did made a 
great decision sending you back there for that one year. Yeah, and I like think you, you want to. <laughs> yeah, you from don't you don't you you didn't want to go, and you it's basically your kind of first time because toddler it, you don't remember anything that doesn't really count, and you just kind of fell in love, and then you stay you. Got curious. That's just so great, amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing. I mean, and it's funny because I really I did fight them, and I'm like, what? I do not want to go. Like, you're going. So, and it's funny because when I, when I first got there, I stayed with my uncle who does not speak any English. So the whole conversation was I could understand him, but all I could say was, how, <laughs> how, just <laughs> yeah. I was like, good, thanks, okay. You know, that's all. That's all I could say for like the first couple days I was with them and then I was sleeping the whole time so the whole thing was them waking me up to eat you know because jet lag I know so jet lagged and then I you know I went to Gentan and then coming back from Gentan I could speak a little and then that's how my Chinese developed because I I had to speak I had to learn how to speak Mm. survival skills survival skills right (laughs) so do you remember what made you like what's the point that you're like oh my goodness I I love this place I, I want to stay what what was it? Was it the people, food, or <laughs> yeah, everything? It was the people, everything. food. Back then, I was in my, you know, I was I was young, so the clubbing, the just oh, and the beauty, the nightlife. The nightlife was great. Yeah, <laughs> it was just wonderful, and even the shopping was fun, and it was just, just everything was just so so great. I mean, I have one of the it was the best experience of my life. Wow. Yeah. wow. So, I have you watched a movie, um, Loving Taipei? You, you know what? It's it's been on my list, and I want you to watch it with my okay, husband. That's fine. So, okay, yeah, I have not watched that, but the book. I mean, the movie amazing. it explained why it's called Love Boat, but I'm just like now I'm just like trying to like fact check it or like just curious, like oh, why yeah. is it Love Boat? Because so I really hooked up. Yeah. Oh, okay. People that's got, what the movie was about too. Oh okay. no, it's absolutely true. So many people hooked up. A couple of my friends who met there got married. You know, wow. they have families now. Yeah. So a lot of people, it's funny, a lot of the parents send their kids there to find a mate. <laughs> oh. No. The parents know as well. Huh? The parents know as well. Oh, no, no. The par- the parents know. That's like the main purpose for parents sending their kids there. Because, okay. you know, a lot of us live in, in remote areas or areas where there are not, not a lot of Chinese people. So they, they want their kids to meet and marry a Chinese American. So they send them over there. Um, and I did not know this. So I don't know if that was my parents' plan because I didn't know anything about this program when I went, but I did meet this one girl and, you know, she was telling me, yeah, her parents saved up money for the whole year and bought her all these really nice dresses so that she could, you know, find a man. I'm like, really? Like I went and like torn up t-shirts and shorts, (laughs) you know, my college wear. That's what I was wearing there. So I'm like, what? (laughs) <laughs> I don't want to spoil the movie for you, but your story sounds exactly like the movie. No, I won't. Well, I did read the book. But you sound like the main character and then met this <laughs> friend who was always well-dressed. That is a movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's in the book too. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. Wow. That's, um, what? yeah, that's awesome. And I played a movie for my high school students and they love it. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, that's yeah. a good idea. Uh-huh. Yeah. They like it a lot, but uh, cool. So, like, what is the age group for this love boat, this program? And when oh, did you yeah. go? Mm-hmm. I've heard that it's kind of gone downhill a little bit. I'm not sure if it's just, it's not the same as when I went. But they started getting younger and younger, and they had different groups. Like when I went there, it was college age to like I was in the oldest group. I was mm-hmm. in um, the the ones who just graduated from like so twenty age twenty one. So I think it went from age. 18 to 21. Everybody was in college or just graduated college. Gotcha. Um, but I know they had a pro. My cousin had gone on a younger program. And I think it was right before that. And he was in high school. Um, so they had one for high school as well. But I don't, it wasn't the same program. Yeah. Um, right now, now love, though, because that's too young. Yeah. So it was a different overseas Chinese study program for them. The Love Broke program, yeah, it was a college, college, great, college age kids. And the counselors were all. Um, previous, um, I guess, participants. Alumni. Yeah, so the counselors are all young. Well, the American counselors were young, and they also had um, uh, counselors from Taiwan. So they they were probably horrified by us. But the American counselors, they had all experiences, so that's why they wanted to come back to be counselors. So 
yeah, you know, we all snuck out at night and and did, did all that kind of stuff. So I'm sure that was on the movie as well. <laughs> yeah, how fun! So mm-hmm. before you went, like you you got accepted to a law school. You just deferred the decision, right? Or you also had to worry about like studying, getting testing to law. School. Oh no! I, well, I did all the testing beforehand, and Smart. then I just yeah, and then I just I actually I had put off because I was thinking of. Um, Deferring anyways, I was thinking maybe I should take a year off. I was going to work at a law firm um, in the States. And then I just decided to stay in Taiwan. So I applied from Taiwan. Oh. And I had all the testing done already. So I did right. all that before I left. Yeah. Gotcha. So like definitely ease off the stress. Like now you have to study for the, the test and oh, all yeah, that. Oh, yeah. I didn't have the study for That's that. That's why you can go clubbing and party. <laughs> okay. Get a full experience. Yeah, so there was none of that kind of stress. <laughs> Have you taken Brendan back to Hong Kong, either Hong Kong or Taiwan? I mean, I see Beijing and Hong Kong. Yeah. So he went, uh, I took him back to Beijing, Hong Kong. We had a trip planned for Taipei, but then COVID hit. So, ah. and we haven't gone. So I went back this past October um, with my sister, my niece, and my mom. Uh, but Brandon was still in school and we couldn't take him. So my, uh, my mom had to go back for something. So we just went. It was great, except for um, Typhoon came, but it was fine. Ty- Taipei was fine. We just couldn't travel around the island, which we had planned. Mm-hmm. So I went back, but Brandon has not been yet. So that's that's on my list of places to bring Brandon. So I, I'm thinking it's got to be during the summer, but it's just so hot. So I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I, I I go back every summer and the heat, it's, and the kids, yeah. they will whine and complain, but when they're in school age, you know, elementary, middle school, high school, just that's the only time. I mean, we yeah. can go back during winter time too, but for me, it's just too short. Right. It's only, we only get two weeks. I'd rather stay longer because I can, I can stay longer. So I want to, you know, take advantage of that. So right. summertime, but it, it is hot, <laughs> very hot. Yeah. No, but that's amazing that you do that every summer because that'll, that'll, their, their language skills and everything will stay. They won't forget it all because they do yeah. it every summer. And if you're there for an extended time, they get the full feel and the full experience. That's that's so smart. I wish I had done that when Brandon was younger, but yeah, I'm I'm <laughs> so grateful I'm able to do that. I know it's I mean it's expensive and it's far. You need time and money, you know, to go back every summer. Um, just besides COVID, that four years, three and a half years, I've been back every year since my daughter was four months old and she's yeah. eleven now. That's amazing. You brought a four yeah. months old bag. That's yeah. a long flight. Yeah, it yeah. was. It was a long flight, and back then there were no uh, direct, direct. So I have to um, oh, you know, connection and right. So it was four months. It was really tough because I was um, nursing and pumping. So I have to like pump on airplane. Oh my god! And it was just a. Uh, it was a mess. <laughs> but I want to go home so bad. I'm like I have to do it. I can do it. <laughs> my mom's there. My family. Everyone's there. So I tried to go back to see them. Yeah. You know, once nice. once a year. Yeah. And they, they don't like to come here. So I have to go back. Yeah. No. That's that's a great reason to go back as well. But yeah. I, we started having Brandon fly. We travel a lot as well. So we had Brandon start flying at three months as well. And yep. Breastfeeding on airplane, that's always fun. Put the cover over, just breastfeeding the whole time so he doesn't cry. Yeah, those are fun days. <laughs> no. I think it's incredible that you go back every summer because that's, yeah. that's hard. Yeah. And um, I when now they are older, when we go back, I sign them up on like summer camps. So oh. hopefully they can learn something. But like last year when we went back, I was hoping, okay, I sign them up for summer camp. They're going to make some you know, local friends, like Taiwanese friends, they can start seeing Mandarin. And that was totally wrong because they made all the friends of like American Chinese, <laughs> all speak English. I'm like, what's going on? Because <laughs> everyone was back. And then, yeah. Yeah, that's... And that's they just we- find, they find each other. Like all the speaking, like English speaking group, they just find each other. <laughs> Mom, I made mm. this friend, she's from California. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> what about your friends in Taipei? I know that you know, and you can. It's funny because I'd just be walking down the street when I was in Taiwan, and people all of a sudden I hear ABC. I'm like, what? American born Chinese. I'm. Mean, how do you know? You know, I live here oh. now this summer, so it's it's funny. 
just oh people... you they know you're right because i will be going out or on the elevator at the mall and they'll be like you know like auntie ah, you like poor poor like oh, older lady and they're like your kids not from here right they're not they don't look like it and then <laughs> both my kids both my kids look at me like why would they say that <laughs> they're like they're so puzzled they're like and i say like, yeah they're not from here so yeah they, they don't look like it they look different oh, that's so funny because they're dark maybe they're dark like they're tan, you know. They 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 do different. I think it's a posture, like the way they care themselves, or like you. Was, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not even children. Uh, we had gone back to Beijing. Um, my 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 parents had come to. We met them over there, and people back then. This is when um, cha- there were people on the streets trying to change money. You know, the the black market changing money, and they were just they would come up to foreigners. And my dad was walking and this guy came up to me, him and said, oh, change of money. And my father was so offended. He's like, oh, my God, I am Chinese. I grew up in Hong Kong and you know, I was born in Guangzhou. I am Chinese. How dare you think I'm a foreigner? So, yeah. And my dad was like, dad. he didn't come over until grad school. So he wasn't in his late 20s when he, or mid 20s when he came over to the United States. And they still could recognize him as a foreigner. So it's crazy. Yeah. He's like, huh? And he was he was upset. <laughs> he was offended. Your dad like, spoke offended. Up no. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> I am Chinese. That's right. I'm Chinese. <laughs> I love that. Um, so you mentioned you guys travel a lot. Can we tell can you share with us a, a like your travel, like what was just like vacationing or like war purpose? Or like, yeah, and then where have you guys been? Oh, gosh, we've, we've been everywhere because we just, we love to travel. Um, I did do some traveling back when I worked in D.C. I worked for the, the government, um, Department of Commerce, International Trade. So I did a little bit of work travel. But otherwise, all my travel is pretty much for pleasure. My husband travels a lot. He does international tax. So he travels all over the world. And sometimes we would kind of tag along on his trips. So mm-hmm. um, we just... Whenever we get a chance before now, it's whenever Brandon is off from school, we will go somewhere. Um, when he was younger, we could pull him out of school when we travel a lot then. And then before that, you know, we travel as much as we could when work permitted. So work got in the way of traveling. But we we travel several times a year. Um, you know, we try to uh-huh. go skiing a few times. We just came back from um, Seychelles. That's why I don't know if you can tell. I'm like so burnt. And I was like, I have so much um, aloe vera all over me right now because I'm like peeling. So I'm like, oh God, I hope it doesn't show up on camera. But so that was the most recent trip, which was amazing. So we tried to go to Seychelles. It's an archipelago in the Indian Ocean off of um, Eastern Africa. So it, it was it was far, wow. but it was, wow. um, it was a lot of fun. We went with some friends. So it's just, it was, it was a great trip, but th- that's the most recent trip. And we just tried to with go to Brendan as well, or just girls trip. Oh, no, no. Yeah. The whole family, families with kids. So it's, yeah, it was, it was a lot of, it was a lot of fun. So Brandon came too. He also got sunburned <laughs> and he's, we're both Are suffering you- from jet lag now. Cause you say like you live in Miami. Like I just thought it was just like, it's always maybe people just look burned or like tan all the time <laughs> because of sunshine. Oh, no. It's funny. Um, so when we first moved down to Miami, we live on the beach. We live in the water. Always on the beach. Always like walking around. Always tan. I'm so jealous. But no, Me no, too. no. I haven't <laughs> gone on sand on the beach in Miami. I don't even remember the last time. Now what? we only go when people go, I don't know. I guess, I don't know. Just maybe take it for granted or you just Is use it. Is it so- as well? I've actually never been. I heard it's like, like a party by young adults. So I don't know. Is it because oh, it's more too touristy to crowd it or just because it's just like right next door kind of take the excitement away? I don't just like, I don't even like the beach anymore. The sand, you feel dirty and then it's sticky from the water. I don't know. Maybe it'll become too old. <laughs> uh, so it's just, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't take advantage of the beaches here anymore mm-hmm. unless someone's coming to visit and I take them. I, I just, I don't go on my own. So it's, it's mm-hmm. weird. I think it's just like the people who live in Orlando. They don't go to Disney World every weekend. <laughs> I guess that makes sense too. Yeah. <laughs> I just feel like because I feel like I can go anytime, right? Yeah. And then just having that thought, like I can do it tomorrow. Why today? And then just keep putting it off. Or, yeah, um, and it's like it's got to be now that we live here. It's got to be perfect weather conditions. If it's too sunny mm-hmm. or too hot, I'm not going. If it's yeah. too cloudy, I'm not going. If it's a little bit of drizzle, I'm not going. So, yeah. <laughs> I live in um, Miami. Did you move 
no, later in life? Well, I, I was born in New Jersey and then I had lived um, uh, in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. We lived on the West Coast of Florida. I lived in Maryland. Um, this is all wow. before college. So we lived in a lot wow. of different places. And then I went to school in um, Pennsylvania and then Connecticut. And my first job out was in New York. I lived in D.C. I went to school in D.C. as well. And then um, my husband and I, we went to law school together, but we were doing long distance for like three years when I was in uh, New York and D.C. and he was in Connecticut. And we're like, you know, we should eat, We got to live in the same place if this is going to work out. So mm -hmm. our options were I could uh, move back to New York, get a job there. Uh, I, um, he could transfer down to D.C. or we could just start somewhere new. And he would always loved Miami. And so wow. and I'm like, oh, so hot. <laughs> And, you know, we came down one weekend. He came down for business and I, he flew me down and it was just so beautiful, so wonderful. And so I'm like, okay, let's just do it. And so we just relocated to Miami. Um, and this was over 20 years ago. And we're still here. Oh, so Brendan, Brendan's born in Miami then. Brendan was born in Miami, yeah. Miami Beach. Yep. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And your husband, is he, I know he doesn't speak Chinese, but is he from Hong Kong as well or Chinese? No, he is. Um, half Vietnamese and half Caucasian American. So he's not Chinese oh. at all. Yeah. That's why he can't. Okay. So can he speak Vietnamese though? Can he, he speak? He can count. He can count from one to ten. <laughs> okay. And that that's it. Because <laughs> I was wondering if he will want to teach Brendan Vietnamese. No, he doesn't. He's never had the urge and he doesn't know enough to be able to. Yeah. Teach. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so that's a shame. It would be nice for Brendan to but at least, you know, I'm trying with the Chinese. So I'll have a little bit of something besides just, you know. Yes. And and like you said earlier, like you, you know, not until college, you can kind of got curious and interested. And you just went and learned the language and culture yourself. And right. yeah. you can so, do the same thing too. Yeah, I'm hoping he'll do, he'll do the same thing. Um, if mm -hmm. not, he already can read and write better than I can. <laughs> so yeah. um, it's just really the the speaking. His 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 accent is very i don't want to be mean but it's horrendous i'm be open. <laughs> really it's, it's really really bad uh the tone. So, but oh god the tones i was like what are tones but you know what his teacher said he's okay his speaking's okay i'm like oh wow she's nice because it's like he, he really needs to work on it but he doesn't want to speak chinese with me so only when he's but you know people. how like when you go back to asia like doesn't matter taiwan i've only been to taiwan so i don't know probably in China, Hong Kong too. Like if when you speak like broken Chinese or Mandarin, they they think it's cute. Like, oh like they don't really judge you. <laughs> you know, like they see you as like oh white go around foreigner and like, oh that's cute to you. Yeah. It's so cute. You know how you speak. <laughs> I've gotten two reactions. I've gotten the oh cute, you try so hard. You uh, know, where what are you? And then I've gotten when all right, so when I was in Taiwan, I had this one taxi driver. I was sitting in the back, so he didn't really see me at first. And so I, we were, he was asking me a question. I started talking with him, and he just kept looking back at me, looking back at me. He's like, what are you? And I'm like, I'm Chinese. He's like, and this is all in Chinese. So it, was, it, was, it sounds funnier when you say in Chinese, but he was like, what are you? I'm like, I'm Chinese. He's like, you are not Chinese. You talk funny. I'm like, what? I'm like, can you understand me? And he says, yes. I'm like, well, that's good enough, right? He's like, oh, you father lazy. <laughs> father lazy. You're Chinese so bad. I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> so that, that's another reaction you get. <laughs> People who expect you to be able to, to speak better because of the way you look. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So most people yeah. are nice. Most people are like, oh, your accent's so cute. Because I, I also I think age too. If we look at little kids, I think in general, like when we look at little kids, we're just like give them more grace. And it's like, oh, you're adorable. And we're adults, yeah. and they just yeah. have less grace or compassion. That yeah, that could be it. Twenty one well, years laughing speech. at it now, looking back, because that could be, I don't know, offensive. It was offensive, but I, also, I thought it was a little bit funny back then too, because I was so proud of myself that I could carry on a conversation with a taxi driver. I mean, there you go. He was accented. He had that Taiwanese accent. Yeah. I understand him. I didn't make fun of his accent. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It can be hard to understand too, for sure. Yeah. So. Wow, well, your sense. life is like so exciting. Just like yeah. not just traveling around, but also moving all over the place. Because that's uh, mm -hmm. moving. It's a 
it's not fun. This can be no. stressful. It is yeah. stressful. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. why we have, we've lived in this house for a long time since Brandon was, before Brandon was born. We haven't moved yet. <laughs> so this is the longest I've lo- ever lived anywhere. Um, but it's, so you know, now, so Eugenia, what, what, is, what is your goal on publishing now? Both? So you just, you're going to keep publishing maybe once or twice a year? Yeah, at, at least once or twice a year. So I, mm-hmm. I feel like I, I want to keep up the holiday books because I, I wish I had done this earlier because a lot of the holidays, I didn't know a lot about them. I know the food, but I didn't know the history or the stories behind them. I didn't know the meaning behind them. So I'm learning a lot while I'm writing these books. Um, mm-hmm. I have um, a new one coming out. They'll be coming out in May uh, about the Dragon mm-hmm. Boat Festival. Mm-hmm. I don't know anything about Dragon Boat Festival except for Zongzi and Dragon Boat oh. Racy. That's yeah. all I knew. So uh, I'm, as I'm, I'm learning about it, I'm writing it, and I want to be able to share that with Brandon and with, mm-hmm. with everybody because I think one of the most fun ways to learn about another culture is through their holidays and through their food. And so mm-hmm. I'm going to keep that up. Um, since I just came back from Taiwan, there'll be another chapter book. Brandon goes to Taipei. Uh, uh-huh. And then, you know, I, I, want, I always want to go back to writing picture books. I, I only wrote the one, my first one. Um, but I want to go back to doing that because I feel like um, the youngest kids are the ones who w- are the easiest to teach and the ones who want to learn. They're the most enthusiastic and picture books are just so fun. So I'm mm-hmm. thinking of maybe uh, the next picture book will be like, Brandon gets a puppy, shall go go. Uh, we, got a, we got a puppy during the puppy. pandemic. Yeah. So everything's kind of still fresh. Our, our dog's uh-huh, kind of right. Well, but I love it. I love how everything is revolving Brandon, his life. Yeah, I mean, he's the reason I write. He's my inspiration, even though now he doesn't. When he was little, he thought it was so cool to be in a book, and I'd come to school and read, and he thought it was Mm -hmm. awesome. And then in middle school, he started getting embarrassed by it a little bit. He's He's a teenager now, right? No, no. So I'm I'm hoping, like, by college or after college, he'll be like, oh, this is so cool. And then when he he has kids, he'll be able to share these books with them. He can teach them the holidays and say, look, I'm a daddy's in this book. Yes, that's like. A legacy to pass on generation after generation. All the books so. writing about him, you know, it's amazing. I hope so. so. Where where can we find you? Uh, your books? Is there a website? Instagram? Oh yeah, I'm I'm everywhere. My website is eugeniachu.com. All my books are on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, Pinterest, YouTube, uh, TikTok. I'm not very active on those, but. You can find me in those places, but eugeniachu.com, there's a link there to all of my social and all my books on Amazon. It's probably the easiest way to order them. Check them out. Awesome. And I will link everything in the show notes so people can find you. Oh, thank book. you. Yay. Oh, okay. last question for the, you say you're coming out with a book, Brendan Go to Taipei, that will be a chapter book. What's the age range? Because I, I want my daughter to read it. She's, oh. a, she's a fifth grader. Oh, yeah. So the age range for the chapter books are like, I want to say second to fifth grade. But okay, I, perfect. It won't, it, it may not be coming out until next year. Mm-hmm, uh, that's yeah. fine. Okay. But yeah, fifth, sixth grade, it should be fine because it's a little bit thicker, but it's it's still your daughter will be, I think, easy for your daughter because she, right. I'm assuming she's probably an advanced reader too. Mm-hmm. So she'll get yeah. the pretty quickly. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, my goal for the chapter books, like second or third grade through fifth grade, mm-hmm. maybe sixth grade. Mm-hmm. So. Yay, can't wait to read it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. This is fun. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode that we brought to you. If you like this episode, if you learned something from us, from our guest, make sure you share it to your friends so they can enjoy it too with us. Bring them in our community. We can learn and grow together make sure you subscribe to our podcast and leave a review so we can hear from you and don't forget to go to our show notes for our free resources we will see you next time bye